right. Well, I'm going to get started because I know I haven't got too long, uh, obviously. But I mean, the, the sure. first question was just sort of how did you come to be involved in Gangs of London and what was the initial attraction for you? So um, Pulse, Pulse Films originally had the idea. They, they had, the, they had the, the IP rights to the video game of Gangs of London, the PSP video game. And, um, and basically what happened was is that uh, they came to me with that and they brought it as a film franchise, uh, suggesting that they would do like a number of films in the series of this thing. And so I was kind of looking at it and I was thinking, well, the thing that I loved most about you know, my rare times in London was the fact that it was so culturally diverse that it had you know, such a global city that you could walk down the street and you had 10 to 15 different languages all at once. And so I felt like if it was a feature film franchise, it wouldn't really kind of be able to fully explore what London really is and what it has to offer. Um, I felt like we'd only end up getting like 10 to 15 minutes of runtime in a two hour film to be able to spend on those kind of side characters, so to speak. And so I kind of pitched it back at them and said like, well, what if it's a long form narrative? What if instead of it being a film franchise, it's a television series and would that work? And so they kind of responded quite positively to that. And then I had a, an initial concept for something when I was living out in Indonesia. And the concept for that was basically, what if there's the, 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 the death of a mob boss uh, that creates a power vacuum? And it was going to be set in Southeast Asia. It would be a totally, totally different thing. But that was a concept. And so I pitched that to them. And then they really bought into that. And so in the end, we didn't really kind of use that much from the video game. It was kind of just the title alone. And we just went off and started creating our own sort of um, world and characters from there then. Yeah, because I think there's something about the kind of gangster genre, particularly in London, that just feels so steeped in kind of um, pop culture entertainment, TV and film. So as you mentioned mm. before, that obviously you have, you know, your, your experiences in London aren't, you, you haven't been there too frequently. So I'm just wondering if you think your in, influences and inspirations came more so from cinema and TV as opposed to real life. Yeah, I think so. I think that's, that's a fair, fair account, to be honest. I think, you know, and partly it was because we were still looking to bring the DNA of what we do out in Indonesia into this series, which is, you know, big set pieces of action. We weren't, you know, we, in, and in order for those sequences to be able to sit comfortably alongside a storyline, it kind of has to feel a little bit more operatic, a little bit bigger and larger than life then. And so we kind of ruled out very early on the concept of doing anything that could feel like a social commentary on what life is really like in London. You know what I mean, so we kind of, everything that we'd researched, everything that we sort of discovered, whether it was, you know, meeting with former undercover police or journalists or, um, or, or former gang members who'd gone straight, all of that stuff we kind of used as a, as a way to kind of leap off from and then look at, okay, well, there's a cool concept here or, or an idea or a flavor here but how can we then ramp that up and make it more cinematic then and that's what kind of made us sort of like stand out and feel a little bit unique and then made it feel like something that we wanted to do and, and gave it its own identity then as a show because of course when you do sort of like the raid it's all you isn't it i mean you're, it's very much kind of your baby and something you have kind of creative control of from start to finish but when you do a tv series yeah. of different directors is it quite strange to be able to watch this series in full and see your vision kind of come to an end and see other people take it on and inject their own sensibilities as, as storytellers into into something that you at one point held sort of so dear it's it was it was exciting and it, it's that thing of like you know when when we were discussing who to bring on and i remember saying to the to the guys at pulse i was like to thomas and lucas i was like i think they should be genre filmmakers and they should be like you know guys who work in film still um you know you know um not as a slight on anyone who works in television at all but we just we just wanted to have that same kind of you know visual approach we didn't want to uh, me and Matt, my co-creator of the show and also my cinematographer, like we, we were kind of saying when we were filming, we were like, I don't know how to shot list this in a way that works for a television schedule. I don't know how to make this work on a sort of on a tighter budget and a tighter schedule. So we're just going to keep doing what we would have done if we were making this as a film. And hopefully we could still make the time, you know what I mean? And then hopefully we, we're not going to be at the end of every day asking for overtime every day. And, 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 and it, it, it worked. And so that was as a sort of as a, process as a sort of as a, as a philosophy carried through then in terms of being able to say oh look um I, i'm fortunate enough to know both Karin and xavier from before um and spoke to them about the project told them what we were trying to do what we wanted to achieve with the show um and they were super enthusiastic and excited to kind of be part of that vision uh, and ultimately that's what it was it was about us all kind of collectively sitting down together and saying this is the world of the show this is the design of it these are some of the parameters that we need to work within and um otherwise have fun you know what i mean uh, and so i think like when it came to like the the early episodes like so i i, I directed episode one which is the double length the feature length one 
And then when it came to episodes two and three, I did the action sequences for those as well then. But then after that, I felt like, oh my God, I'm, I'm robbing Corin and Xavi of being able to have fun here. So uh, for Ep 4, I just let Corin do his own thing for the action there. And then I directed episode five myself then. So it was kind of weird in a way because I was setting it up to start with and then jumping in in the middle and then leaving it back to them again to kind of take it to the home stretch then. Because you mentioned the, the sort of fight sequences, which are so well choreographed, as, as would be expected uh, with, with your work. But I was just wondering about sort of who you worked alongside, because obviously in the raid, Eco, I know, to, was, was a huge part of making sure those see, he was almost more than just an actor, wasn't he? He was like a, a sort of choreographer yeah. in many regards. So just wondering about sort of if you brought anyone over from your time in the raid to, to help you on this project, or if you just learned so much yourself that you were able to kind of... <laughs> No, I don't have that ability. No, no, <laughs> at all. Um, basically, I was very fortunate. I made a film called Apostle about two years ago for Netflix. And on Apostle, I was looking for a stunt coordinator. And I was introduced um, to a man called Jude Poyer, who is now my stunt coordinator across Gangs of London as well. And Jude um, has a very sort of like interesting background in terms of we have a shared interest in, in Hong Kong action cinema um, to the point where Jude went a whole step further than I could have gone. And he traveled out to Hong Kong when he was 19 because he was a martial arts practitioner who then became a stunt performer in the Hong Kong film industry. So, you know, talk about earning his stripes. He did that with the, you know, and then some. And then he came back to UK and worked here in the industry for a while. And so when, um, when I got introduced to Jude then on Apostle, I just realized straight away that both him and his team had a shared philosophy. You know, they, he understood what I was doing out in Indonesia and I understood what he was offering me for the stuff that I was doing here. And so we both kind of collaborated then to a degree where when it came to gangs, it was really exciting to kind of be able to say, it's not a possible, we did like two or three small, small, small things where it was more horror based stuff. It wasn't like pure out and out action in a way. And so then when it came to gangs, it was almost kind of like, oh, okay, let's have fun with this. We can, you know, gloves are off now. What do we want to come up with? What do we want to design? And so, um, yeah, I found, found very quickly and very early on that um, the work that I was doing with Jude and, and with Chris and the rest of the team was, was, was something really, really special. And, and so, you know, as much as I loved and, and really enjoyed everything that I got to do with Eco and the boys out in, out in Indonesia, and it's been an absolute sort of like, you know, joy to see them go on from strength to strength i mean i mean their careers have just taken off now um you know it, it was it was good to kind of like be back here then and find a group of people that i had that same shared philosophy with and and i believe that yeah we've we've delivered some pretty wild sort of action sequences across the show i don't know how many episodes you've been shown yet but um episode five <laughs> one and two yeah so far okay Episode, episode five was when we decided to just go crazy. Um, so episode five is wild. Like, you know, you know the ending of Ep 2? Yeah. Um, the, the ending of Ep 2, imagine that stretch across 20 minutes. It was oh. just, it's just it, we, we, went, we, went, we, went, we went nuts on it. But um, yeah, it was, it's a, it was a good fun episode to do. Yeah, thanks, Gav. You're making my isolation and sort of <laughs> very much easier. <laughs> um, but I was wondering, you just sort of to touch upon, you just mentioned um, how proud you are and stuff of the way sort of, sort of Eco's career and stuff because I mean I went to um went out to Atlanta Georgia for the film Stuber which he was on and he was obviously oh wow sort of lead villain in that and just the way that everyone spoke about him and I just even because I just I loved the raid like so many people did and I interviewed Eco for the raid uh, one and two and and so and then when when I went out to America it felt like I almost felt a bit proud that he kind of gone out and sort of spread his wings like that. I mean I, I imagine it must be the case for you how often do you guys keep in touch and because you came through this this film the rate it just blew up you know you guys became yeah. so big and, and went to sort of travel the world of it do you feel like you've you've always sort of shared something together that you no one will ever really quite be able to understand in some ways yeah i think you know it's like every time he does something anytime he works on something like it's like uh, it's the usual thing i'll see something in the the, the the trade press and stuff and i'll be like oh congratulations you're gonna be doing this film it's amazing da, 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 da. and then he'll be asking what i'm doing next and everything else we, we we chatted the other day actually like literally two days ago so yeah we keep in touch you know and same with like with joe and with the iron and the guys and stuff like that so whenever whenever possible we we, we kind of like get on whatsapp and just chit chat back and forth and see what we're all up to next um we haven't yet found that like i i've I've long talked to him about like, oh, I got this idea of this project and it would be a thing that we could kind of work together on again. Um, and we've been talking about it for a good while now, but it's always like, it's always one of those things where it's like, I need to sit down and write it. And then by the time I'm contemplating doing that, 
you know, he might be signed up for like two more films or something or other. And then I can't, you know, wait for that time to be available. So it's, it's always been kind of like chicken and egg, chicken and egg and stuff like that. But we do, we do have plans to kind of work together again at some point. I'd love to kind of, you know, what I'd love to do now is find a way to kind of mesh his style with the style of the guys that I'm working with here. Cause it would just be like an amazing sort of like fusion if we could just smush their styles together and to see what comes out as a result of it. Well, yeah, talking of which, I mean, you know, obviously when we all, we all sort of raid loved it and then out came a second, uh, could, could, has there been any talks of developments about Gangs of London second series? Is it something you might, you'd be interested to pursue further if, 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 if sort of given the freedom to? Yeah, I think, I think there's definitely space there. There's definitely scope there. Um, there's lots of room for the story to continue to evolve and, some of the characters to carry on <laughs> not going to say who um, um, but you know it's it's um there's there's a lot there's a lot of like a potential there for for a second season and i think like obviously you know conversations are happening behind the scenes and everything else and blah 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 um you know we're waiting to be honest like my my brain is just purely focused on thursday and on what happens and how people take to it and how people respond to the show you know that's that's sort of like the excitement for me it's sort of it's with it's bizarre now with it being television because usually the you know the the response I get from showing a film in a film festival is that that's that's my sort of litmus test in a way it's like seeing it with an audience and then oh are they reacting are they responding um, you know and, and now it's going to be okay how many people are going to give me uh, awful messages on Instagram or or how many people are going to be kind and polite to me on Instagram so it's a fascinating little sort of uh, world we live in now so that I think that's where all the feedback's going to come back from and also probably worth remembering that though anyone who doesn't like anything are usually much louder than those who do so <laughs> they are they are but you hear them more though that's the thing it's like you, know, you could get you could get 10 great re- like people who say they don't read reviews they're lying we all read everything and it's like you know, if you get like a positive review you read like you know, 10 positive reviews and it makes your day the one negative review that you read then it's like oh okay and nothing else counts now you know what i mean yeah. kind of, it does it just sticks in your craw a little bit but yeah because it but must be strange because like you said you know you go to watch the raid of an audience and there's audible gasps i mean i went when i i saw it a couple of times and the second i think the second time i saw it in the cinema um some people went to the front and started like reenacting bit it was just this kind of med- <laughs> no way experience. yeah whereas i guess with the tv you are relying on hearing people typing stuff or like hearing people tell you stuff it, it must be quite a different thing to know because you're still creating something that is immersive and still very visceral and yet you haven't yeah. got that first-hand experience in some ways yeah it, it is a bit it is a bit it's gonna i don't know yet because i haven't experienced it so this <laughs> will be the first time i get to find that out but it's like but you know we've 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 kind of stuck to the things that we know the things that we do the best and i think like you know that we have moments within all of the fight sequences all of the sort of the action sequences where there are you know those audible gasp moments and and even though like i i I just feel like you know even if it's not in a cinema with like 200 people all gasping at the same time the idea of three people sat on a couch and they all react or flinch at the same moment can still create that same thing of like a communal sort of levity almost it's like it softens the blow of what you're seeing because you're like oh my god we all just reacted in the same way to that absolutely absurd ridiculous piece of action that we just saw you know and so if we can kind of maintain that um on a, on a much smaller scale um then yeah yeah I'm, I'm excited to see the results of that excited to see how the reaction well i can tell you now that me and my wife watched it and there was lots of audible gasps <laughs> so, <laughs> amazing um so my, my, my very final question really because i'm about to run out of time but it was just um about i mean obviously there's so obviously it's hard not to, to bring it up at the moment considering we're talking on zoom <laughs> because of the what's yeah. going on in the world i was just wondering about um, what, how this has affected your, your sort of career and did you have any projects that were underway that have been halted and from a sort of director's point of view what has COVID done to, to the industry because we all know it from an audience point of view I'm quite interested yeah. to know how it's affected you um, I, I, it's a weird one for me because I, I don't feel like I'm speaking on behalf of an industry because I, I've been remarkably fortunate in, 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 in the way that this has kind of unfolded at the time that it has you know I was we were on the cusp of delivering the episodes to the broadcaster. We didn't have that much work left to be done. There was still a lot of, you know, still a lot of like, you know, little bits, pieces of work that had to be done in terms of mastering and the color grading and the sort of the sound and the, the VFX and, you know, all of the sort of post-production houses, um, the look who did the color bang post-production, who did the, the sound and then all the VFX houses that worked on it, you know, um, top down, they, they were all still working, but they were, you know, they were able to thank God, create a sort of remote infrastructure through which we were able to still get files bounced to us so we could check and 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 sign off on 
And so, you know, we, we, were, we were quite fortunate in that respect. You know, if we were in the midst of production, I can't imagine it must have been awful. You know, because there are some people who have been setting up what might have been their first film, their first feature. And it all relied on it happening two weeks ago. And now that might have gone and there's no sign of that letting up. And so that project might just go now. You know what I mean? So I can't imagine how awful it must have been for some people within the industry. Um, you know, and, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm developing other films right now. I'm developing other projects. Thankfully, that requires me to be sat at the table with a laptop and write. You know what I mean? So it's like I, I can still function within my version of the industry for now. I can still function on a remote level. So I'm very, very fortunate in that respect. Um, but, you know, it, it still stings because there are crew members. Like I tend to gravitate towards the same people quite often. You know, I work with a lot of the same people. And so it's that thing of knowing that there are crew members out there that work on a freelance basis that, you know, might have been requiring March and April to be a solid paycheck for them. Um, and so, you know, it's, 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 it's nerve wracking. And you, you know, you, all we can do right now, myself and like Ed Talvin, who's my producing partner that produced episode five with me in Wales, we brought that to Wales. What we're doing right now is, is we're trying to kind of, you know, create as much content as possible to start working on um, scripts and ideas and, and design and concepts for other projects that we can maybe engage other writers to go off and, and write so that there'd be enough work that we can present and, 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 and get crewed up and casted up as soon as we're able to get this industry back on its feet. Like we just, uh, but until really, to be honest, until we know when that is going to happen, it's, it's all, you know, speculative for now. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Gareth. It's been a real pleasure. And Sorry I ended on a downer then, isn't it? No, no, no. <laughs> well, well, on the flip side, we were all stuck in our, in our, in, inside and we're about to be, watch Gangs of London. So, you know, it could be worse. Sure. <laughs> no. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. No, uh, thanks so much for your time today. It's been a real pleasure. And um, yeah, hopefully, you know, for series two, I'll be able to speak to you in person. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I hope so too, yeah. All right, good. Take All care, right. bye-bye. Take care and stay bye. safe. Thank you. Bye-bye. Ladies and gentlemen, you're watching... Hey, you guys! Hey, you guys, huh? Hey, you guys. Is yeah. that from the Goonies? It is indeed, yeah. Nice. Hey, you guys!